All right, you can turn in your Bible this morning to Matthew chapter 16. We're going to talk today about the unscriptural church building. Oh no, another controversial sermon. Well, I'm not preaching it to be controversial and to, and to get people riled up without a cause or anything. I'm saying these things, I'm going to be speaking about this this morning because I think that there are some very serious problems with building these huge buildings and calling, calling them churches. And I know a lot of good Bible-believing Christians are in church buildings, and this message is not you know, intended to prove that you're heretics or anything like that. It's just I want you to think about this thing of a church building because we're going to see in this study that the church buildings are tradition. That's all they are. There's no scripture telling you to build a church building. And you say, well, then it's a sin to build a church building? No, I wouldn't call it a sin. I would call it an unnecessary waste of money. And it leads to other problems. But if you're listening to this thing, I want you to consider the verses that we're going to look up today. Uh, now, let's begin here in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. We're going to look at the very first reference to the word church. It says here, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock will I I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So, who is the church founded upon? Peter, right? Wrong. <laughs> if you're a Catholic, you believe it's Peter. That's a lie. That's not what the verse is saying. Jesus is the rock of our of our salvation. Okay, He's the foundation of the church. So, who does the church begin with? Jesus Christ. Okay, he's he is the one that the church is is founded upon, and he's the one that started the church. Now, what's the last reference to the word church? Turn back to Revelation chapter three. We'll see here the last reference to the word church, the last time it appears in your King James Bible. <clears throat> Revelation chapter three, verse fourteen. Okay, it says here, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Jump, jump down to verse 22. He that, hath an ear to, uh, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Okay, so the last time that the word church appears, singular church, is there in Revelation 3.14. Now, the word church is essentially just a word meaning a called out assembly. Okay, it's you can't really affix it to the church age and nowhere else because there are some scriptures, some of which we're going to be looking at, uh, that refer to the church being in the time of Jacob's trouble, Okay, which isn't really a big deal. It's just a called out assembly. But I want to focus mainly here on about the thing of a church building. Now, the reason I had us look up these two verses here, Matthew 16, 18, and Revelation 3, 14, is because it gives a picture of the body of Christ, the church age, as it's called to those who study dispensationalism. Okay, It begins with Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, you know, there on the cross. It begins with that, and it ends with the falling away. Okay, And you can read about that in... Uh, Second Thessalonians, I guess it is, you know, about the falling away coming first. Okay, um, now let's look at First Corinthians three, verse nine. The question comes up: Is the church a building? That's what most people think of when you say the word church to the average man or woman today. They will think of a building. They have it in their mind that this is a building. We're going to see what the word church actually means here. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. It says here, For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. So, who is the, or what's the building there? We are. Our bodies are. Let's look at, uh, jump down to verse 16. There in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. It says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. So again, you see the thing of your body is the temple of, of God. 
Okay, it's not some kind of a building, and I can't possibly go over all the references to the word church, but you'll see that if you want to take the time to study it, go through your New Testament, you won't find one time where church is a reference to a building. It's always a reference to God's people. Now go over to chapter 6, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 15. And we're going to see the thing here again of about your body being the temple of the Holy Ghost. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 15. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. Let me just stop there for a minute. That action right there <clears throat> in verse 16 is called fornication in your King James Bible. Did you know that the modern versions take the word fornication out? They do. And they replace it with sexual immorality. Like the NIV, they do that. I'm not sure what some of the other ones do. But the point is, you tell young people about sexual immorality, they'll think of things like sodomy. Well, some will. <laughs> some don't even consider that immorality anymore. But the point is, the word fornication is the right word. Okay, You should never join yourself up with a harlot. Okay, a prostitute. But let's continue here. Verse 17. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Now look here in verse 18. Flee fornication. There it is. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Okay, <clears throat> and by the way, it's not just, fornication is not just a fleshly thing. There's also a spiritual fornication. You can read about that in Revelation chapter 17. Mystery Babylon commits fornication with the kings of the earth. Okay, that doesn't mean that the Pope is going around, you know, doing weird things. It, it just simply means spiritual fornication and we're going to see about a little bit of that here but it said there about <coughs> the fact that you are bought with a price okay what was the purchase price of your salvation the blood the blood of jesus christ that's a very great price that the lord had to pay now turn over to second corinthians chapter six. Second corinthians chapter six Verse 14. Now, I've talked about this in, in different sermons, but we, you know, we're going to go over it again here just to prove some points. Uh, if you talk about a church building, most Christians think of a church building as a place, a public place where anybody can enter in to it. And I want to show you from these scriptures here that that's not right. Verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers... For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? Now the name of this church here is Bible Believers Fellowship. And we didn't call it a church. We didn't say Bible Believers Church for a very specific reason. Okay, we don't want people thinking of a building as the church. The title Bible Believers Fellowship is... We use that because we are Bible believers and we meet together for fellowship. Now, fellowship is people of like mind coming together and talking about things that are going on in their lives and relating to one another. That's the purpose of the church coming together for fellowship. It doesn't mean you sit around and have a good time, you know, and just have a party. That doesn't mean that. It means that you are fellowshipping as Christian brothers and sisters talking about the things of the Lord. Now, can you have fellowship with unsaved people on the same level that you can with Bible believers? No, you can't. And that's what these verses are saying. A lot of people talk about this as being relating to marriage. And of course, marriage is an important thing that you should marry somebody that's saved. But that's not talking about marriage. And we're going to see that as we continue. It's talking about your worship. 
that you shouldn't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers in the sense of when you come together for fellowship. That's what it said right there in verse 14. But look at verse 15. And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Verse 16, And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. It's talking about church. It's talking about the assembling of the saints. That's what that's talking about. Let me just pose a couple things to you here. Uh, <clears throat> you say, well, I don't know, Brian. I think that Christians should come together, you know, and we should all meet, and everybody should be welcome in our big church buildings. Well, let's just... I want to make a point about that. This morning we sang a hymn in our hymn book, uh, Jesus Loves Me. Now, it says there, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Children, all to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. And it goes down through, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. You know, it's a very familiar, you know, most, it's usually sung by kids, but it's good for adults to sing it every once in a while. But now, if you have lost people come in, do you want lost people singing that? I mean, you know, how would it be if you actually went and you were witnessing, going out door to door to the lost world and you went up to somebody that's lost and you said, you know what, you're one of Jesus' children and he loves you. No, that's not true. That's a lie. Okay, if they've rejected Jesus Christ, God's love is not upon them. Okay, what about uh, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there? Let's all stand and sing. Everybody stands up and sing. and I'll be there when the roll is called up yonder. No, you won't. Not if you're lost. How about the like a river glorious is God's perfect peace? You have lost people coming in and singing that. And by the way, that's how a lot of the big modern churches, that's how they draw the crowds. They'll take God's promises that he makes to Christians about peace and love and comfort and joy and hope. And they'll put that out there. There's a church in our area here and you always see that stuff out on their, their sign outside. Verses of comfort and joy and hope for Christians, but they apply it to anybody. And you come into our church building here and you know we'll, we'll give you comfort and we'll tell you how much God loves you and things like that. It's wicked. That's not of God. Uh, <clears throat> the whole point is our hymns in our hymn book are for saved Christians. They're not for saved and lost. So it's a real problem. You're actually sinning by bringing lost people in and telling them to sing these songs. I mean, if you really want to have a true, proper church building with saved and lost meeting, the pastor or the song leader or whoever should stand up and say, okay, all the saved stand up and sing this song, but if you're here today and you're lost, you have no right to sing this song. But do they do that? Are you kidding me? <laughs> you aren't going to make money that way. <laughs> That's what it's about. Get them in, get their money. Because you got bills to pay, you know? I mean, see how this stuff, see how there's problems there? It's just incredible. Now we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 10. This is probably one of the most famous verses that you'll hear about churches. Hebrews chapter 10. And of course here, doctrinally, I believe this is pointed towards tribulation saints. But you see the same concept there as, a, as of the church being a called out assembly. But you'll see it here. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of every one saved and lost together. Is that what it says? It says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Well, that sounds like it's excluding the lost. Yeah, it is. Uh, continuing here, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. 
Now, in context there, the day is the day of the Lord, the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the Hebrew Christians, or I shouldn't say Christians, but the Hebrew believers in the time of Jacob's trouble, who this book is written to, they're, I mean, right now, we have to assemble together as Christians, and we shouldn't be bringing the lost in. But in the time of Jacob's trouble, it's going to be even more so. Because you're going to have the lost world, if they take the mark of the beast, they can't be saved. So you don't bring anybody into your assembly that has the mark of the beast. That would be a real bad idea. You know, it talks about, back in the Gospels, it talks about that they'll be putting, causing you to be put to death in this time period. So it's going to be really important in that time of Jacob's trouble that only saved people meet together. You know, and you shouldn't make sure you don't forsake that assembling of yourselves together. Okay, so it's it's true for us today, though, in the sense of you see that thing again, where it should only be saved people meeting together, not lost people. Uh, turn to Philippians chapter one. Philippians chapter one, verse twenty-seven. Now we're going to see some church age doctrine. Okay, part of the reason I hit the verse there in Hebrews is because that's one that will be used. I've actually had that used against house churches. You know, you say, well, I'm part of a house church. Well, the Bible says not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. It's like, yeah, <laughs> we're not. You know, we assemble ourselves together. It's just kind of funny how people try to use verses like that. But here in Philippians chapter 1 verse 27 it says, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Do you know what the problem is with the average church building? They're not in one spirit and they don't have one mind. And instead of striving together for the faith of the gospel... They strive together about the business that they run, called a church building. Okay, and I'm going to get—I don't want to get ahead of myself here, but modern-day church buildings are businesses. They are literally corporations. That's not an insult. That's not me attacking anybody. They are literally a corporation. They are a business, and you get lost people coming in there, and they say, well, "We think it should be run this way." You know, I heard a story recently of a funeral where a grandfather died and this guy went to the funeral and he had two daughters, two grown daughters, and he thought that they were saved. And they said to him afterwards, they, they came up to him and they, they were mad because the pastor mentioned hell. And he mentioned that you have to get saved or else you'll go there. And they were mad and they said that was inappropriate for him to say that at our grandfather's funeral. And this, this Christian man, he, he said, he said it was just so shocking to him, and he said, I guess I guess they really aren't saved. Yeah, they aren't. But see, that's what happens when you bring saved and lost into a church building. The lost get offended when you start preaching against sin, so they start to, and if they have the money, they'll start pulling the strings. See, it's a bad, bad idea. Jump down to Philippians 2, 2. We'll see the same thing here. It says, Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. Look at one more verse like this. 1 Corinthians 1, 10 says here, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. How's that possible with saved and lost? It's not. Just as simple as that. And you can pretend that, well, you know, yeah, but we gotta, we gotta build them this big building so we can get them in to get them saved. Well, we're gonna cover that in just a little bit. Now, one of the objections that you're gonna hear, if you want to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, one objection, one scripture that is often used by some of the brethren, Four church buildings, four bringing saved and lost together, is in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 22 and 23. We're going to see this thing here. Now, before we read this, I want you to keep in mind that this was written to a church in the first century, and some of the sign gifts were still around. 
Okay, they were still lingering there. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 22. Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. Now look at verse 23. If therefore the whole church be come together into one place, and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned, or unbelievers, will they not say that ye are mad? Now see, that's one scripture that will be used by church building people. They'll use that and they'll say, see, the church has all come together into one place and an unbeliever comes in. Right? Oh, well then church buildings are okay. Wrong. Okay? First of all, verse 22, tongues are for a sign. Who are the sign gifts for? First Corinthians one twenty two. for the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. So you still have that thing there where they're still ministering to Jews. Okay, the nation of Israel wasn't set aside officially at that point. Okay, but look at verse 23. Notice the very first word, if. If, not when the whole church comes together. If, therefore, the whole church be come together into one place. Now, point number two, one place. Does that mean a building? No. Doesn't mean a building. That could have been a park, it could have been out in a field, it could have been in somebody's house, it could have been wherever. <clears throat> it could have been out on a street meeting, they're out there preaching and, and things, and, and the Corinthian church, by the way, is the most carnal church that Paul wrote to. They were the ones that were having the most trouble with the flesh. So anytime you have somebody going and getting major doctrine out of the out of Corinthians, you better be careful. Okay? That verse right there does not prove that you should have a church building. Nowhere in that scripture is there a building mentioned. Okay? It's not there. Not a good argument. Now let's look at another argument that will be often be used. Verse 19. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 19 says, Yet in the church I had rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Kind of rough for you if you think that you have to have the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That's not as important as five words in your own language. Okay, just a little side note there. But it says there in the first part, yet in the church... And again, the building Christians will say, see, you have to be in the church. That means a building. Right? Wrong. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. Back towards the end of your Bible. 1 Peter 2, verse 5. Okay, it says here, 1 Peter 2, 5, Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Okay, now, I can't get into a big study on this, but it's very interesting. You can read about it back in Revelation, how that each one of us is a spiritual stone. Okay? and Or a, a lively stone, excuse me. And that when we come together... We're built up into a spiritual house. Okay, it's, if you want to picture it kind of like Legos, you know, Jesus Christ is the foundation. And then each Christian comes along and clicks into that foundation. And then other Christians come and we click into that and click into that and click in, into that. And so we are built up into each one of us is the temple of the, of the Holy Ghost, our bodies. But when we come together and we, we, share things of the Lord and we talk about things, we come together for fellowship, then each member is a member of the church and we all grow up into a spiritual house. Okay? That's why Paul wrote about being in the church, yet in the church. Okay? He was meaning in the midst of a bunch of Christians, not in Christians and lost people. You know, I would say it's kind of like, you know, Christians are like Legos. We click, we should click together and fit together. But then a lost person comes in. It's kind of like a, you know, Lincoln log coming in. <laughs> Doesn't click into the Legos. And it's interesting because if you're really truly a Bible believer, 
if you really are King James Bible believing fundamental Christian and some lost person comes, you can't have fellowship with them. They want to talk about things of the world. We want to talk about the Bible and it's like they don't even understand what you're talking about. And you say, well, I don't know, Brian. I, I go to a church and, and I know that there are lost people there. We have real good fellowship together. Well, you might want to check whether or not you're saved. Because I know of, of a lot of professing Christians that get along fine with the lost world. They don't have a problem with the lost world. Yeah, it's a bad thing. It shouldn't be that way. We as Christians, we're to be a peculiar people. We're to be different than the lost world. Okay? Now let's look at some dangers of church buildings. Okay, we're going to go to the next section here. Danger number one. The people think that God can only be found in an official building. Okay, that's the first danger. Turn back to Acts chapter 5. We're going to see a real good example of this. Acts chapter 5 verse 40. If you want to study the book of Acts sometime, the reason it's called Acts is because it it's relating to you the acts of the apostles, what they were doing after Jesus Christ gave them the Great Commission and the church began and then what they were doing. And they started out going to Jewish synagogues and temples. And you say, oh, well, then they had church buildings. What well, we're going to see about that. Acts chapter 5, verse 40. Uh, here, you, we, again, we can't go over the whole story, but basically you have... Peter and some of the other apostles were taken in to this. They were in there preaching in this Jewish synagogue and they got in trouble with the leaders. And they uh, had a guy stand up, uh, Gamaliel, a Pharisee, and he told them that, you know, he came up with the idea of we should beat these guys. Look at verse 40. And to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Boy, I wonder how much of that spirit is found today among Christendom. Verse 42, And daily in the temple and in every house they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Oh, well, see, they had a temple. It was probably called the First Independent Baptist Temple of Antioch or something. No. It was the Jewish temple. And look where it got them. They were beaten for preaching in that temple. It wasn't that they were welcome there and, they, and the Jews said, hey, this week we're going to have Peter and the apostles come in and, and give us a, a good revival meeting. No. They were not welcome there. That's why they were beat. Okay, But notice there they were preaching in every house. We're going to get back to that in just a little bit. Turn over to Acts chapter 6, verse 8. Now one of the early Christians named Stephen is in there and he's, he's back in preaching and the Jews are getting pretty hot at him. Verse 8, it says here in Stephen, Full of faith and power did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and Cyrenians and Alexandrians. Oh boy. If you know anything about Alexandrian philosophy, Alexandrian textual criticism, it started way back in the first century. But let's continue here. And of them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Then they suburned men which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council and set up false witnesses which said, this man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place. Oh boy. And the law. Okay. Now notice there, they equated their building with a holy place or as a holy place. And if you remember when Jesus Christ died on the cross, when he, you know, gave up the ghost, what happened to the temple veil? ripped why 
Well, we're going to see why. But let's continue here. Verse 14. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council looking steadfastly on, on him saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. <laughs> kind of funny. But see, they were still confused about the fact that Jesus Christ, he said about that I will destroy this temple and build it again in three days. They were still thinking that he meant the actual Jewish synagogue there. It's not what Jesus meant. Okay, he was talking about his body. And they didn't understand that. But you see, they had a reverence for a building. And they thought because they were in the building, these guys were crooked. They were lost. And they were disputing with a Christian. But see, they thought in their minds that they were the ones that were holy because they were the leaders of the building. You know, that still continues today. There are, I would say, the vast majority of religious buildings are run by lost men and women, you know. And they think that we're the weird ones, we're the wrong ones because we're Bible-believing Christians. And if we were to do this, and I don't, I don't, you know, say that you should go into church buildings and stuff. I think that, you know, the advice there about let them alone, they be blind leaders of the blind. Don't go in and rile up a, a Catholic church or something like that. You know, I, I wouldn't do that. You know, give them tracks outside or something like that. But, you know, you don't have to go in. But if you did, guess what would happen? They'd do the exact same things that they did to Stephen. And you say, well, what did they do to Stephen? Well, let's look here. Stephen gets to preach to the council. And uh, we'll jump down to Acts chapter 7, verse 44. Acts chapter 7, verse 44. Now, Stephen is a Jew, and he's speaking to these Jews. That's why he says here in verse 44, it starts out, Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus unto the possession of the Gentiles, whom God drave out before the face of our fathers and unto the days of David, who found favor before God and desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob. Okay, so they, God instructed them, back in the Old Testament, you can read about it, how God instructed them how to build this tabernacle. And he built it to be mobile, to be portable. Okay, there wasn't supposed to be a fixed foundation and everything else. But then they got into the nation of Israel. They got in you know, Jerusalem and everything else. Now look at what happened here. Uh, verse 47. But Solomon built him an house. Okay, now if you remember back in the Old Testament, if you've ever studied it, they had this tabernacle that moved through the wilderness, but then when they got into Jerusalem, Solomon decided to build this big elaborate house for the Lord, this big elaborate temple. Uh, verse 48, Howbeit the, the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet. Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What house will ye build me, saith the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Hath not my hand made all these things? It is kind of silly when you think about it, you know, and you, it's so funny because you, you'll meet Christians today and they have these big, huge buildings and they'll say, this is the house of God. Huh? I mean, you know, I heard a message recently about how God, the, the size of God, how, how great he is. And they were talking about outer space, that you could travel for 500 million years at light speed going through outer space and still not reach the end of it. It'd take you a couple million years traveling at so many million feet per second just to get out of our galaxy. I mean, it's incredible how big space is. And yet the Bible says back in the Old Testament that he measures the span of the universe, of the heavens, it says, with his hand. In other words, from the thumb to the pinky finger, the span of his hand is God measures the universe. And you're going to build a house for him here on earth some place where he's going to be confined to? you got to go somewhere to this special building to meet God? Wrong. Doesn't work that way. Now Stephen gets a little bit militant. Okay? Uh, oh, and by the way, before I continue, one other point I want to make here quick. Um, what happened to the temple? 
there in Jerusalem, the one that Solomon built. It was destroyed, yeah, but what happened, what did Solomon start bringing into it, I should say it that way? Pagan idols. Well, that doesn't happen today, does it? Yep. A lot of these big, huge church buildings that are built, they turn into temples for pagan idols. I mean, seriously, really. I mean, Bob Jones University has an art gallery that's filled with Roman Catholic paintings. And they bring secular things in. They have opera and stuff like that that comes in. What's going on? They built a huge, big place. That, oh, it's just so wonderful and everything. And then they have secular things coming into it. There was a guy, I, I forget who it was, one of the big old-time preachers, and he had this huge, big Baptist temple thing. And he died, and the thing folded up because they were there worshiping him. And now it's run by some charismatic, you know, wacky thing. See? It doesn't last. Another good example is J. Frank Norris. Back in his day, he had the two biggest Baptist churches in the world, pastoring two of them. He'd go on a train between the churches on Sunday. I think the one was in Detroit, the other one was down in Texas. And he'd speak at these churches, you know, back before airplanes. <laughs> you know, he'd, he'd go back and forth on a train between these two giant church buildings. You know what they are now? They're modern churches. They're no good. And the pastor of the one up in Detroit makes fun of J. Frank Norris and says about how that these people that used to worship here, we don't have anything in common with them. See? Church buildings don't mean anything. Oh, the holy temple of God. Nonsense. Absolute nonsense. But now let's look here uh, at verse 51. Stephen starts to get a little bit militant here. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. Now, What's the reaction of the Pharisees, the religious leaders? When they heard these things, they said, well, we respect your opinions and, you know, we... No. It's funny because the ecumenical movement, the one world church movement, they'll respect the, the beliefs of lost people. But they won't respect the beliefs of a Bible believer. It says here, verse 54, And when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looking up steadfastly into heaven, and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God, and said, Behold, I see the heavens open, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, and stopped their ears, and ran upon him with one accord. <laughs> see, they were in one accord too. Uh, verse 58, and cast him out of the city, and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Kind of interesting, because they couldn't answer Stephen, and he was hurting their reputation, so what did they do? What was the only option left? killed him but of course that won't happen today right yeah we'll get back to that in just a little bit now did the jews learn their lesson acts chapter 21 go back to the end of the book of acts or close closer to the end acts chapter 21 verse 27 Now, if you remember there in, in back in Acts chapter 7, you had Saul there. And Acts chapter 9, he gets saved and he changes his name to Paul. And uh, it's kind of interesting because the thing that he saw there in Acts chapter 7, he actually ends up, it goes right around, and now he's in that same position as Stephen. Acts chapter 21, verse 27. 
And when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews which were of Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him, just like they did to Stephen, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man that teacheth all men everywhere against the people and the law and this place, oh boy, and further brought Greeks also into the temple and hath polluted this holy place. Well, I guess they didn't change. Years and years and years went by, and they still are calling their synagogue, which God has left. <laughs> He's not even in it anymore. They're still calling it the holy place. And they're wanting to kill people that cross them, basically, that uh, don't do what they tell them to do. Verse 29, For they had, had seen before with him in the city Trophimus and Ephesian, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. And all the city was moved, and the people ran together, and they took Paul and drew him out of the temple, and forthwith the doors were shut, <laughs> excommunicated. <laughs> Verse 31, And as they went about to kill him, tidings came unto the chief captain of the band that all Jerusalem was in an uproar, who immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down unto them. And when they saw the chief captain and the soldiers, they left beating of Paul. Then the chief captain came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains and demanded who he was and what he had done. And some cried one thing, some another among the multitude. And when he had, and when he could not know the certainty for the tumult, he commanded him to be carried into the castle. And when he came upon the stairs, so it was that he was born of the soldiers for the violence of the people. For the multitude of the people followed after crying, Away with him! And as Paul was to be led unto the castle, he said unto the chief captain, May I speak unto thee? Who said, Canst thou speak Greek? Art not thou that Egyptian, which before that these days madest an uproar, and leddest out into the wilderness four thousand men that were murderers? <laughs> it's amazing the rumors that will be spoken about a Bible believer. You know, Paul's an Egyptian that led four thousand murderers out into the wilderness? <laughs> what? You know, it's kind of funny because I had a uh, one of these new version apostates uh, write a comment on one of my videos and he said, where's your wedding ring at? You know, he was probably all excited. He thought he was you know, going to prove that I was divorced or something. <laughs> and then he wrote another couple comments later. Oh, I see that you never wore one. Like, yeah. Uh, you know, he's probably really disappointed because he was really going to prove that I was uh, a daughter or something. You know, it's ridiculous. But they'll come up with all kinds of stuff like that against you if you're a Christian, Bible-believing Christian. Verse 39, But Paul said, I am a man which am a Jew of Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city. And I beseech thee, suffer me to speak unto the people. And when he had given him license, Paul stood on the stairs and beckoned with the hand unto the people. And when, they were, and when there was made a great silence, he spake unto them in the Hebrew tongue, saying, you mean that there was part of the New Testament in Hebrew? Yeah, apparently. Well, then it was a translation. And no translations inspired, right? Yeah. Okay, continuing on here. So you see that they didn't change, by the way. Uh, turn back to John chapter 4. John chapter 4, verse 19. Now, where do you have to worship God? Where do you have to go to worship God? We're going to look at that here. John chapter 4, verse 19. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. So then you have to go to Jerusalem? Now, let's keep reading. Verse 21. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah, Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Verse 26, Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. 
I just wanted to read two of those verses there, those last uh, verse 25 and 26, because John Hagee, a big faker, said that Jesus Christ never claimed to be the Messiah. He just did. He just read it. Okay, don't believe any of these, you know, big cell evangelists on TV. Okay, now, in the Millennial Kingdom, all nations are going to go to Jerusalem and physically worship, worship Jesus Christ. Okay, but right now, the fact is, they that worship the Lord must worship in spirit and in truth. Now, God is a spirit. So where can you worship the Lord? Do you have to go someplace special to worship Him? No. You could worship the Lord in a house. You could worship the Lord in the forest. You could worship Him out in the fields. You could worship in the, in the city. And you could worship Him in a building. Okay? It's right there. But to teach that you have to have a church building or else you can't worship the Lord, that's unscriptural. It's not what the Bible teaches. Okay. And by the way, by the way uh, why did John Hagee lie about Jesus? You know, Jesus never claimed to be the Messiah. You know why he lied? For the same reason a lot of these other big guys lie. Because they're tied to a building. And they have bills to pay and they're making a lot of money. See, you might start out okay, but if you get into a big building program, you are now trapped. You are now a slave to that building. And that's one of the big dangers of it. Okay. Uh, John chapter 14. Turn to John chapter 14, verse 23. John chapter 14, verse 23. And we're going to see the thing here about spirit and truth. It says here, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Where can that be done? Anywhere. Okay? You worship the Lord in spirit. The words are the spirit. Spirit of truth has come. He will lead you in all truth. And uh, spirit and in truth is how you're supposed to worship the Lord. And you can do that anywhere. Okay, And, your fa and God the Father will come unto you and make his abode with you. Now, danger number two. Uh, church building is very easy for Satan to destroy and control. Okay, I want, to, I want you to think about a couple points here. Who can afford a church building? I looked into it, you know, when we were, you know, when I was making my video about how to start a house church, and I found a small little brick little church, and they were asking $300,000 for that thing. That's a lot of money. And you get into these big, huge churches. I mean, the one we used to go to, it was a million-dollar property. Now, how do you get that kind of money? Well, you have to go and you have to borrow the money, don't you? You have to get into debt. And it's kind of funny. I thought about this point. You know, I'm in video ministry. Now, if, if I came out and I said, I'm going to be going to the bank and taking out a loan for a million dollars to, to start a film company, people would say, I think that's kind of excessive. I don't know about that, Brian. That, that doesn't sound right. But if I went and I said, I'm going to take out a million dollars, or get a loan for a million dollars to build a building, a church building, and make it real elaborate, stained glass windows and everything else, people would say, oh, well, that's of the Lord. <laughs> no, it's not. You shouldn't be building church buildings. Okay, It's an incredible waste of money. And think about it. Like I said, if you have take out a loan to buy a church building, you're controlled by the bank. They own you. You have a monthly payment that you have to meet. Okay? It's bad. You say, well, then you can rent a building. You can rent a storefront. Well, then you're owned by a landlord. Okay? You still have a monthly payment that you have to meet. So it, it will affect your preaching. You know, when the giving starts to go down, you got to start giving messages on giving. Or preaching messages on giving. I mean, it's just the way it is. Now think about something else. If anybody at all can walk into your church off of the street, how easy would it be for Satan to infiltrate and send in troublemakers into your church? Very, very easy. Okay, and how many preachers have been messed up by pretty women that come into the church and, and they end up committing adultery with them? Happens a lot. 
You know, I've seen it happen numerous times. I mean, you hear about it a lot. And I can't get into this subject. I'm tempted to. But what about 501c3? Most church buildings are under an IRS code known as 501c3, Section 501c3, tax-exempt status. And when you put yourself under that, you are putting yourself under government authority and government control. You are literally a government corporation. And people say, well, aren't Christians supposed to submit to the government? Well, let's look at that. We're not going to turn to these scriptures for sake of time, but uh, Mark chapter 12, verse 17, this is one that you're going to hear used. Jesus answering said unto them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. Now, people say, well, you're to render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and, and to God the things that are God's. Okay, does the church belong to Caesar or God? It belongs to God. Caesar doesn't have any business, or government doesn't have, they don't have any business messing around within church matters. Okay, Jesus Christ is supposed to be the only head of the church. Ephesians 5, 23 and 24 says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Okay, now, Jesus Christ is supposed to be the head of the church, not the government. And guess what happened here in the last week or two? Gay marriage was legalized in New York, the state of New York. Okay, now, when folks want to get married, where do they go? Let's find a church where we can get married, a church building. Now, guess what? Right now, most of these sodomites are going to want to go to a sodomite preacher or whatever. But sodomites are sick and twisted enough. There was an article in the paper where some preacher was, was protesting at a gay rally and one of the gays came up to him and was trying to kiss him and did, in fact, kiss him on the face. And fortunately, the police were there and they arrested this, this gay supporter and actually defended the rights of the pastor. But there are perverts out there, and this and this gay supporter, by the way, she was a 74-year-old woman. That's how sick and twisted these people are. But these perverts are going to get a kick out of going into churches and saying, you're going to marry me and my pervert partner here. You're going to do it. And the pastor's going to say, oh, no, I don't think so. And it's going to go to court. And guess what's going to happen? These queers, these sodomites are going to say, hey, this church is a 501c3. It's a government corporation. It is public property. And we want to be married there. And this guy's refusing it. And you know what's going to happen? The government is going to step in and say, this law has been passed. You will marry this couple. And you will not preach against the sin, this lifestyle. You know, they won't call it a sin. That's going to happen here in America. I guarantee you it's going to happen. Okay, what are they going to do? What's going to be their defense? See, they've yoked up with the government. The government is now the head of the church, not Jesus Christ. You know, they're going to be forced into it. Also, here's an article, and I'm not going to read it, but 50 churches last week, exactly one week ago on Sunday, 50 major churches here in America read from the Koran as a show of that they want to build a bridge with the Islamic people. You see, I used to say the church is going to be destroyed. You're going to see the church destroyed. No, you won't. That's not prophetic. Okay, These wicked churches are going to grow and get bigger and bigger and bigger. And what they're going to do is they're going to start forcing this on all churches. And those churches, those church buildings, I should say, that have already yoked up with the government, they're going to be forced into not only marrying sodomites, but they're also going to be forced to respect other faith traditions. It's going to happen. You're going to see it. And if the Lord doesn't come back soon, we're, we're going to see it, and the real Christians are going to be persecuted. Okay? But uh, the question comes up, can't, well, can't we have government in between God and man? 
First Timothy 2, 5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. You can't put secular government in between God and man. It's just not going to happen. Jesus is the head of the church, and he's the only mediator between God and man. Okay, what's the purpose of secular government? Am I anti-government for saying they shouldn't be in church? No. The purpose of secular government is to punish evil and to enforce the laws. They have no right to be in the church. None whatsoever. The secular government shouldn't be dictating what we preach and what we teach. That's wrong. Okay, da danger number three. People think you act differently when you're in church. Did you ever hear that? You know? And uh, how often have you ever heard a Christian say, and I've heard this personally, they'll say, well, you know, I wouldn't do that if I was in church. Well, you're in church. We say, what do you mean? I'm not in church right now. You should be. If you're not in church, then that means you're not saved. <laughs> okay, you are the church. Going to a building doesn't mean that you act differently there, you know, not the rest of the week. Okay, and, and two, you know, you should be acting like a Christian and praying and studying and singing hymns and things and witnessing at all times. Why? Because you're in the church at all times. Okay, and a lot of people say, well, you know, I just want to put in my time, you know, three days a week and then, and then that's it. All right, a couple more points here and then we're done. Some typical questions that church building Christians are going to ask. Okay, if you decide to have a house church, you're going to get these little, uh, well, what about this? You're going to get some of this. Okay, question number one, how are we supposed to get lost people saved if we can't invite them to church? Answer. Nowhere in Scripture are Christians told to build buildings to bring in the lost. That's not in the Bible. Okay, That's why the title of this message is Unscriptural Church Buildings. Okay, Mark chapter 16, verse 15. This is one of the most well-known verses. Jesus speaking, it says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost has come on, upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. It's funny, I, I didn't see anything in there about going and building buildings in the uttermost part of the earth. He didn't say anything about that. You're to be witnesses unto me. You see, Christians are supposed to go out to the lost and witness to the lost, and then bring them into the church. You don't build a building and say, come come in. Okay? It's not a good idea. All right, now question number two that you're going to get is, um, they'll say, well, hasn't God used church buildings to save people? Okay? That's another one that you're going to hear. Well, let me ask you a question in return. Hasn't God, hasn't God used prison to save men? You had a prison guard there in Acts chapter 16 that got saved, and you had Onesimus in Philemon, verse 10, that got saved because of being in prison. God used prison to get people saved. What about battlefields? Have men gotten saved on battlefields? What about hospital sick beds? Yeah. God used all those things. So then I guess we should use those things as evangelistic tools, right? You see the absurdity of that argument? You know, God God has used church buildings to save people, so we ought to have church buildings. No, that doesn't work. Okay? It's not a good answer. Um, and, and let me just say this simply. Has God used church buildings to save people? Yeah, there have been some cases of that. Okay, there have been Christian people that, you know, wander off the street and they go into the church buildings, they hear the singing or something, and they end up getting saved. That has happened. But now let me ask the difficult question that a lot of you don't want to think about. Has the devil used church buildings to damn people to hell? Yeah. Now, who has been more successful with church buildings? God or Satan? I'm not talking about independent Baptist fundamental Bible church. I'm talking about you go down through a town and there's a building there that's a church. Whatever it is. Who's used them more? God or Satan? Satan. 
Hey, we're just looking at facts here. Be honest. Just because it's a church building doesn't mean that anybody's even saved in it. Okay, the fact of the matter is, Satan, he likes church buildings. Okay, I guarantee it. Just the way it is. And finally, one more point I want to consider here. 1 Peter chapter 5. I'm going to go back there quick. 1 Peter chapter 5. What's the purpose of the assembling of the saints? I mean, why do you come together? You know, what's what's the point of it? 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. Okay, it says here, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Look at verse 2. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd uh, shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. What's the purpose of Christians coming together and being assembled? To be fed. The pastor's job is to study the word of God. That's why he should be an older man. He shouldn't be a novice. He should know the scriptures. And when the Christians come in, you get that new convert. You were out. You met somebody at work. You met somebody on the street, wherever. And they're just they just got saved. And you bring them to the church. They need to be fed the word of God. They need to understand about prayer. They need to understand about the Bible. They need to understand about dispensationalism, about the rapture, about what salvation means, what God's grace is. All those things, they need to be fed. Now, I'm going to close here with just a little scenario. Let's say we go out and we get a church building. Now, I'm the pastor of the church here, and Sunday morning comes around, and we got our little church building. Everybody drives there, and we get it, you know, we're opening it up, and we got the temperature set right and everything else, and we're getting ready for the, the message. And I wanted to preach on dispensationalism. Okay, I want to teach my people, I want to teach the Christians that I have at my church, I want to teach them how to rightly divide the word of truth. Okay, or any subject like that for Christians. And so I'm up there and I'm, I'm kind of, you know, greeting some of the members of the church and getting my sermon notes all ready and I'm ready to preach and everything else. And I look back and all of a sudden I say, oh, wait a second. Who's that? Oh, some strangers walked into the church, huh? I better go back and greet them. So I go walking back. Well, hello, I'm Pastor Brian, and and uh, what's your name? And they tell me their names, and they say, uh, yeah, we're we're kind of new to the area, and and uh, never really been into church much, and we really don't know what to believe, and uh, we just wanted to come in here. Well, now I say, okay, well, you know, it's nice to have you and everything. We'll, you know, we'll, I'll talk to you more after the service, but you know, it's nine o'clock. You know, we got to get started. Uh, we got a schedule to keep here. And so now I go back up front and get ready to preach my sermon for the morning or 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock, whenever. Now, I was going to feed my flock. I was going to feed the Christians that God gave me charge over. But now I have lost people that came into my church building. Now, what do I have to do? What do most pastors do in that situation? They forsake the feeding of their flock to do an evangelistic message to the lost people. And how many churches do you go to where that's all you get every single week? Every single week you aren't being fed. It's just this anemic little sermon for the, for the saved people. And at the end it always swings over to salvation. Every single week. I've gone to churches that are like that. You get to the end of the service and, and you know, you're talking about giving or something like that and you know well maybe one of the reasons you don't give is maybe you don't know the lord maybe you've never trusted jesus christ as your savior well friend today's your day now is the day of salvation every head bowed every eye closed no one looking around if you're here today and you don't know for sure whether you're going to go to heaven when you die would you raise your hand and say preacher pray for me every week and that's what you get in a lot of these church buildings why because they're bringing in the lost along with the saved. 
And what is happening as a result is the saved are not being fed the word of God. It's interesting because that church I was talking about, there were numerous couples that left the one time and the pastor was upset about it and he said, you know what he said? He said, he, he said I, one of the couples gave me a letter and they said, we are not being fed here. Yeah. And he said, you don't come to church to be fed, you come to minister. I thought, you're ridiculous. You don't know your Bible. Christians are supposed to be fed by the pastor. That's why he's being paid. It's not an evangelistic center. Okay? That's why I'm against church buildings. Because it becomes a compromise. You're bringing in the lost world. Just a, It's a very, very bad idea. And I'm telling you what, as time goes by here and these sodomites get stronger and stronger and stronger and they start coming into these church buildings and they start demanding that the preachers there marry them, there's going to be some very hard decisions to make. And you're going to see a lot of Christian pastors, you're going to see them tested and tried. And unfortunately, I think a lot of them are going to fold. I think a lot of them are going to compromise and say, well, you know, I, I maybe we could learn to love them and, and we'll just lead by example. And mm -hmm. You're going to see it. Why? Well, because way back with the Protestant Reformation, a lot of the Protestant reformers left the Catholic Church and they didn't really leave the Catholic Church. They brought a lot of the ideas of Catholicism with them, one of which is to have holy temples and holy buildings, which have no basis in Scripture. None. Now, if you're going to one of these big church buildings and you're starting to see some of these compromises and you're seeing the pastor doing this evangelistic stuff and the lost world coming in, I would suggest you leave. Okay? I know a lot of Christians say that they weren't really fed the Word of God until they got out on their own and started looking up sermons and things online. That's pretty sad. But that's the way it's going. Okay? So, that's it for this morning. I'm going to be talking the next time about unscriptural Bible colleges. <laughs> so... While I'm on the uh, kick the church traditions uh, rant here, we're going to kick something else which is considered very sacred here uh, probably next week, Lord willing. So that's it for this morning. Thank you for listening.